All right, my young friends, we are about to plunge headfirst into the fantastic world of organic chemistry today. And I know you are so excited about this development, okay? Organic compounds. Um, let's um, back up a bit and just remember where we've been, okay? We've talked about elements and we've talked about compounds. We've talked about atoms and we've talked about molecules, okay? Uh, remember that there are, if you look at the periodic table, there's 90 elements that occur naturally in this world around us and humans have created, invented a few more elements on top of that. Um, now, of those 90 elements that occur naturally in the world, there are about 11 that are pretty common in living things, okay? Now, of those 11, there are really only four elements that make up the vast bulk of you as a living thing, okay? There are four elements that really make up most of a living thing. These four elements are carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. By far and away, those are the four most important elements, atoms, that make up your flesh. When you touch your body, you are touching mostly carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen chemically bound together into different compounds, okay? In fact, these four elements make up, hold on, let me get my little pen going, about 96% of you, okay? Um, now, you might say to me, wait a minute, Ms. Coleman, I thought we were mostly made of water. It is true that you have a pile of water in your body, and by weight you are a ton of water, but I want you to think of this as like a water balloon, okay? If you have a water balloon, okay, the water that fills the balloon is not technically the balloon. The balloon is made of rubber. It's made of latex. and that. Well, your body is much the same way. Your body, um, the, the water that fills your body is just filling the cells. The cells are built of different stuff, and that's the part of you I'm talking about. So the water that's in us is filling our cells, is filling things in our body, but it is not what our body is made of. It is not what the balloon is made of. The balloon is made of latex. The balloon, in this case you, is made up of organic compounds. Now, yes, there's water that fills up these little balloons, these little cells that we have that are made of organic compounds. So water is very important, but it is not what makes you, you, okay? It's kind of filling you up, if you will. All right, um, so these four elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, make up the vast majority of what your body is composed of. Now, there are other elements, probably 20 in all, that are found in smaller amounts in your body. So you're not just made of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. There's stuff like iron that plays an important role in your blood. Um, stuff like sodium and things like that. These are important elements as well, but they are, not, they are only in very small amounts compared to these main four, okay? Now... Um, in general, on planet Earth, there are we, we take all of the compounds, if we took all the compounds uh, that make up substances on planet Earth, we would divide them into two groups. Scientists divide them into two main groups, organic and inorganic, okay? Now, uh, what we're going to do right now is talk about what's the difference between organic and inorganic, okay? First of all, organic compounds are mostly what you are made of, okay? So again, if we're talking about a water balloon, this is the balloon part, not the water. You are made of organic compounds. That's like that balloon is made of latex. It's the stuff that you touch when you touch your hand. Now, what is it about organic compounds? What makes them different from inorganic ones? Well, all organic compounds t contain carbon and lots of it. Carbon is the centerpiece atom of all organic compounds. It is extremely important. So they contain carbon. Also, organic compounds tend to be very large molecules made up of perhaps hundreds, if not thousands, of atoms. <clears throat> okay, so they're very big molecules as far as molecules go, understanding that molecules always are very small 
to us because we can't see them, okay? They are also, which stands to reason, if they're very big, they are also very, very complex molecules. They take on very complex shapes. Now, also, normally in organic compounds, we are not talking just about carbon. Almost always that carbon is chemically bound with lots and lots of hydrogen as well. So normally when we're talking about organic compounds, we're talking about lots of carbon, but that carbon is bound up with hydrogen also. Okay, so we're looking for not just carbon by itself, but usually carbon with hydrogen and probably lots of oxygen and nitrogen as well. Okay, now organic compounds are the primary compounds that make up the working parts of living things. Okay, uh, the, the stuff your skin is made of is organic compounds. Yes, there is water filling up the cells of your skin, but the, your, your actual cells are made of organic compounds. Now, all that said, what then is an inorganic compound? What makes it different? Well, generally they don't have carbon. There is one important exception to this. Carbon dioxide is a really very common compound and it's got carbon in it. It is CO2, as you can see. If you look down here, it's a drawing of carbon here in the middle with two oxygen atoms on either end. That's CO2, okay? Um, the difference between about this, if you'll remember organic compounds, we just said are big, they are complex and they often have hydrogen bound up with the carbon. Well, if you look here, CO2, certainly there's, as you can see by the chemical formula, there's no hydrogen. Plus, it is very small. It's three atoms, so it's not big, it's not complex. Uh, it's a very simple compound. So even though it does have carbon, we do not consider this. It is not considered to be an organic compound. Okay. Now, what else do or inorganic compounds tend to be? They tend to be small compounds. They tend to be simple in their structure. But even though they are not considered the major compounds that make up a living thing, they are still absolutely essential for life. I mean, think about water. Uh, again, here's our H2O molecule. It's Life as we understand it on Earth can't exist without water, even though water itself does not construct the cells of your body, it's very important in how the cells of your body function. Uh, it's just like the water balloon. A water balloon, the balloon is not made of water, but it certainly will not have the characteristics of a water balloon if you don't have the water inside of it. So. Um, Inorganic compounds are extremely important for the functioning of living things, but when we are talking about what is a living thing made of, what is this tissue here made of, we are talking about organic compounds, okay? All right, um, okay, water, carbon dioxide, even though they're not organic, are very essential for life. So, we've already established now that carbon is at the center, is at the center of organic molecules, and organic molecules are at the center of what create, what, what living things are made of. So what is it that's so special about carbon? Fundamentally, carbon is a fantastic tinker toy, meaning as atoms go, it is great to use to build complex things, okay? Um, why is that? It has to do with it's outer shell electrons or valence electrons. Valence means those outer shell electrons, those that are on the outermost shell. So let's think about carbon a little bit. Carbon has an atomic number of six. So let me draw a carbon atom here. And it's got protons, one, two, three, four, five, six protons. Now, if it's gonna balance itself with electrical charge, it's got to also have six electrons, okay? Remember the inner shell, the inner electron shell can hold two, so there's one, two, and then the next shell can hold eight, but carbon only has six total electrons, so and we've already put two here, so one, two, three, four, plus the two on the inner shell gives us a total of six. Now remember that Eight is the magic number. That is, all atoms 
are most stable when they have eight electrons in their outer shell. Well, if you look at this carbon atom, it's halfway. If we took away all four of these, then it would be stable because its inner shell here would then be full and that would be it. But if we put four more electrons out here, then it would have a full outer shell and would be halfway, it would be have eight on the outer shell and that would make that outer shell full. So it's halfway, it's halfway to being full, okay? That makes this atom behave in a particular way. It really doesn't want to just lose electrons, but it's not equally eager to gain electrons. What it likes to do really well is share electrons. And that's what carbon does better than almost any atom that exists, okay? It likes to form very stable covalent bonds with other atoms. And indeed, because it has four valence or outer shell electrons, it very readily forms four covalent bonds with four other different atoms. Again, picture a tinker toy here with all of its places on uh, its surface that are ready to engage with bonds with other tinker toys. This has got four places where it is eagerly ready to engage in making strong, strong bonds with other atoms, okay? So what is so special about carbon then? The fact that it has four valence electrons and it is not really eager to lose them. It's not really eager to, it doesn't have a strong enough pull to gain them, but what it does have is the ability to form really strong shared or covalent bonds with other atoms. And these bonds are very strong as are all covalent bonds and they are very stable, okay? So what we see here is a carbon atom. And again, you see uh, the blue indicating the four Co, uh, four outer shell electrons that carbon has, and each hydrogen has one electron. So when these guys share, the hydrogen thinks it has a full outer shell of two, and the carbon, when these all of these guys share, carbon now has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight outer electrons, and it thinks it's full, and these bonds are strong and stable. Okay, so what this means for carbon is that because of this ability to form these nice stable covalent bonds it can form carbon chains chains of just carbons think about chains of tinker toys going in a long long row it can form chains of almost unlimited length by bonding with other carbon atoms, okay? As you can see here, these are some really common hydrocarbons, which just means carbons with hydrogens thrown in. Look at this, carbon, 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 carbon. This is, this is the structure of motor oil that you would put in your automobile, okay? And what you have here is just this incredibly long chain of carbon, and also you've got hydrogens bound to the other uh, electrons of the carbon atoms, okay? So incredibly long chains of carbons can be formed, which means if you've got incredibly long chains, there is an opportunity to create lots of complexity. Now, you might look at this and say, but Ms. Coleman, is that really complex? I mean, look at it. It's really pretty simple, isn't it? Just a bunch of carbon, 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 and then some hydrogens stuck on it. That's it. Carbons and hydrogen. Is that all we're made of? And to you, I would say, good point. And no, that's not all we're made of, okay? To add complexity to this carbon backbone, we gotta kinda trade out some of these really simple hydrogens for other more complex structures. And that's where we derive our complexity from in making up these complex molecules that make up our bodies, okay? But understand what is so special about carbon is that they can form long chains, just like Tinker Toys, of almost unlimited length. And then what can happen is these long chains can fold up and make crazy shapes 
much like we see here, and make incredibly complex molecules that are complex because of the shapes that they create. Okay? Um, so, the bottom line then about carbon is that you can connect lots of them together and because of that it has a huge potential for making an incredible variety of different types of molecules that are shaped in crazy ways and, and otherwise just allows for lots and lots of complexity. Okay, Now, fine, okay, so how do you build an organic molecule? How do you make this great big thing from these little bitty, little bitty parts? Okay. Uh, some vocabulary we need to get down. First of all, a polymer is a general term, a general term for a large molecule, a really big molecule made up of many smaller subunits. I want you to think of polymer as being like a train, okay? So if this train here is a polymer, okay, each little car in the train is a subunit. Okay, and if we connect the little subunits together, we create this polymer, this complex molecule. So the monomers are, uh, the, the, the little train cars are more simple and the big polymer is more complex. So monomer then is each little train car. And so a monomer is a small subunit that can be joined with other subunits, other train cars, if you will, to make the long polymer. So monomer plus monomer plus monomer plus monomer plus monomer gives us a polymer, okay? Now, that is the fundamental structure of most organic compounds, okay? Now, this term, polymerization then is simply the process in which you build a polymer from a bunch of little building blocks, a bunch of little monomer building blocks, okay? So the process of building large molecules by joining together many smaller monomer subunits, okay? Um, so polymerization then is simply the way we can get great big complicated wow, look, it makes this complicated skin stuff, and all of that large molecules forming from smaller, simpler ones. Now, another term you need is the term macromolecule. Macromolecule is just the term for a polymer that's exceptionally large, and that's most of the polymers in your body, actually, are macromolecules. They are incredibly large polymers. They're not just a few monomers glued together. There are thousands of them. And when something's that big, we would call it a macromolecule. Macro, of course, means large. Okay? Now, how we build these organic compounds. We build them by a chemical type of chemical reaction called dehydration. So, if you're dehydrated, what have you lost? Why? Of course, you have lost water. You're feeling thirsty, you've lost water. Well, in dehydration synthesis, we are going to remove water from these compounds, and we're going to build an organic molecule by doing so. And you might say to me, but how? I don't get this. Here we go. Dehydration synthesis makes polymers. So let's say if we look here, these little purple circles are monomers, and we've got a little short polymer made up of these three monomers, one, two, and three. And I want to make that, that polymer a little bit bigger. I want to add this guy to it. Well, all monomers, at least organic monomers, have at each end, if this is my center monomer, at each end of them, they have a hydrogen and a hydroxide, or basically that and that together would actually make water ultimately, but they are separated. If you look here, here you can see the hydrogen and the hydroxide group. Now, here's what happens. When we want to connect this monomer to this small polymer over here, we bump up, just like two train cars, so to speak, we bump up the hydroxide group on this guy with the hydrogen group on this guy and we bring them together and what do we create? We create a water molecule and that water molecule leaves 
And what you end up with is a covalent bond that connects this polymer that we originally started with with this monomer, and we get a nice strong covalent bond. But as part of that reaction, we lost a water molecule from the whole combination. So why do we call it dehydration? Because we've lost water from them. Okay? So dehydration just means to lose water. Dehydration synthesis means we are going to make something when we do that. And what we make is a polymer. Okay? Or a longer polymer. All right? Now, Suppose we want to take that polymer apart, okay, which we often do. When you eat a sandwich, you eat it, you digest it, you're going to break down the polymers that are in that sandwich, the big molecules that are in that sandwich. Here's how you're going to do it, okay? You are going to do something called hydrolysis, which in plain English is you're going to put the water back that you took out to build the polymer. You're going to put it back and you're going to break down the polymer. If you look, uh, hydrolysis is simply the process in which polymers get broken apart. Digestion is a great example of that. And you simply add back the water that was taken out. So if you look over here, here is the polymer we just made in the previous slide. We've got one, two, three, four monomers. We've got a little water molecule right there. We're going to add it in, boom, and when we do, we're going to separate, adding the OH back to this guy, adding the H back to that guy, and they separate. And now we are breaking down that chemical compound. Okay? So it breaks a polymer into monomer subunits. And a great example of where this would occur would be in digestion. Okay, you break down the big molecules of your sandwich into small little molecules like this, and then your body can use those to create energy or whatever it is your body needs to do. Okay, so the bottom line then about making polymers or organic compounds, um, small subunits, monomers, get linked together by covalent bonds to make large polymers. Okay. Um, so dehydration reactions link them together, in which we lose water, and create covalent bonds between those little subunits as a result. To break apart those big polymers that we make into smaller subunits, you just pop the water back in and you will break them apart. And that's called a hydrolysis reaction. Okay? that breaks those covalent bonds between those little monomer subunits. Okay, um, so again, bottom line, really, really long, complex, like a train, molecules can be made and broken down by those dehydration and hydrolysis methods, okay? Like linking and unlinking cars in a little train. Now, we are about to embark on a discussion of the four major groups of organic compounds. But what I need for you to remember fundamentally is that even though these compounds are slightly different, these groups are slightly different from each other and do different things, fundamentally they are all built in the same way by dehydration reactions. And fundamentally they're all broken apart in the same way by hydrolysis reactions, okay? And what are those four groups of organic compounds? They are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And the rest of our uh, journey through here will be looking at each of these four groups and describing what they look like, what they do, and things of that nature. Okay, that's it for now, and I will catch you in the next podcast. Take it easy.